plan to finish the Loverapod trial today, but there was a lot in this section, so I've split it up into two. In this video, I'll talk about pages 109 to 131. I began this section with Lydia's deceased sister in mind. I still think we should have been told about her before this. I do think the author knew about her. Four years ago is when Lydia and Louisa moved into their bedroom and I think this must have happened because of Clarissa's death. And this was also the point I'd say that they left the schoolroom. So I'm not sure, did the author just think it wasn't relevant? Or did she not know how to approach it? It was something back in these days that they did. They didn't dwell on death. Death was around them. There was more of it. Every family saw death in a way that we don't today. And I know the idea was that you trusted in God and carried on and didn't dwell on those who you'd lost. But when you're writing a story, you do need to mention it at least once to the reader. And I think it's a shame that we didn't know it. Not that Clarissa is a big part of this story going forward either. In the early pages of this section, what I guess I'm calling chapter five, Sir William, Louisa and Fred go for a visit to Charles's library. Charles was very keen after getting his books that they would come and of course he wanted Lydia to come. But Lydia felt that it really wasn't appropriate for her to do that. and. Sir William agreed. She refused on the grounds of delicacy and the author clearly approves. The reasons why she didn't go might not be so obvious to a modern reader. She didn't go because firstly it might have looked as if she wanted to see the house from a purely mercenary perspective what it was that she might get as the wife of Charles Mornington and she didn't want to seem like a grasping sort of person. And doing that would be in bad taste. The other reason is that she didn't want to give Charles Mornington any false hope. So Lydia stays home and it's her father, her sister Louisa and her cousin Fred who go to the house. They spend an afternoon there it seems. They do go into the library and we see it through Fred's eyes. Fred is not at all pleased to see the drawing that Lydia made on the wall now framed in a, what he considers a garish frame, a very bold frame. And he's very concerned that other visitors to Highlands are going to see the drawing on the wall and think that there is an understanding between Charles and Lydia that doesn't really exist because it's a very intimate thing to do for an unmarried woman to give her drawing to an unmarried man. His mind is put at ease when Charles says that nobody comes into the library except himself and his steward. Then they go on a tour of the house and once more we're seeing it through Fred's eyes and Fred is hugely impressed by the house, it's a big house, it's quite grand and he thinks if Lydia sees this she's going to be influenced by it, it is too good to pass up. That does bother him. And then we slip into Louisa's mind. Louisa sees the house as a very good house but while she likes the house she's not impressed by the furniture. Charles has added some furniture of his own. The house came partly furnished but he added some furniture of his own and his own additions are very gaudy and not in good taste. Not only that they are yellow and apparently Lydia doesn't like yellow. So Louisa thinks that the furniture won't impress her. Then we jump into Sir William's mind and Sir William thinks likewise. He thinks the house is very grand, he's very impressed and he's thinking kind of the opposite of Fred that what a shame it is that Lydia is going to turn all this down because he's pretty sure at this point that that's what she will do. And then Charles takes them to his gallery. He employed an agent to bring in works of art in the way that he furnished his library. He, When he did his library he sent off to a bookseller and said send me all these books to fill my library, the sort of things that should be there. He did the same thing for his gallery. He employed an agent to go and find him fine works of art to fill his gallery. It turns out the agent scammed him. So William and Louisa and Fred can all see this at a glance. Charles spent a huge amount of money on a whole lot of artworks that he was told were original and the three of them are looking at them and recognising that they are actually very poorly done fakes. But 
for various reasons they don't feel that they can tell Charles it's not their place and it's a hard thing to do because we're in Sir William's head at this time he's having a bit of a battle because he cannot even pretend to admire them they are just so wrong he's quite appalled so that's kind of the first check for Sir William about Charles Mornington is he feels that anybody could look at these works of art and see that they're fake, see that they're just not the way they're meant to be, that they're missing the finer details that artwork has, that if you looked at a picture of the original in a book I suppose you would recognise that they are not as good. But he says nothing and the tour goes on. They finish at the conservatory where Charles collects together a basket of flowers for Lydia and then they walk back. When they return they find Lydia reading a book and there's a fair bit of description about how she looks. She's sitting there resting her head on her hand and her yellow curls are sort of spilling down over her shoulder and she's looking very beautiful and both Fred and Charles are struck by how beautiful she looks. Charles gives her his basket of flowers and she's absolutely delighted because they're beautiful flowers and even though she really isn't happy to see him, she does like the flowers. She's so happy about it that she kind of reaches out a hand. Hand gestures are something that they did. There were ways that you reached out your hands. There were ways you took somebody's hand. Charles takes her hand in his and goes to raise it to his lips to kiss it, which is a very forward thing to do. Now he might have the right to do that in a way because he has made the proposal of marriage she could expect that she did give him her hand but he's taken this gesture one step too far and before he can actually put her hand up to his lips she pulls back and she blushes rather furiously so then we have some conversation they are beautiful flowers and she says they are as lovely as i imagine the flowers to have looked that eve attended and then charles says who's Eve? And Lydia is a little bit taken aback by this because she meant Eve in the Bible. Fred realises this and there's a little bit of discussion about Eve and Lydia quotes from Milton's Paradise Lost, which I think it mentioned before, is her favourite poem. And Fred knows Paradise Lost, Fred knows Milton, but Charles is completely lost. He doesn't know the reference. He knows that they're still talking about Eve and the Garden of Eden, but he doesn't know the reference at all. And then Lydia turns the conversation to Milton, which isn't really a change of conversation because she had been quoting Paradise Lost, but to Charles, he has no idea why they're suddenly talking about Milton. And from Milton, they move on to Shakespeare, where he feels that maybe he can contribute. So he says how much he likes the play, The Merry Wives of Windsor. And he describes in great detail how when he was in, where was he? Rome. When he was in Rome, he was in company with an English party, as he says, meaning just a group of English people who were titled people who acted out the Merry Wives of Windsor. He obviously enjoyed it very much and he talks in great detail about how they padded themselves out to make themselves look plumper and how they changed their voices. And this goes down like a lead balloon because The Merry Wives of Windsor is one of Shakespeare's plays for the rabble, for the common folk. It's not one of the artistic enlightened ones. Certainly it isn't one that the Middlemore girls or Fred are interested in. And Lydia is surprised that titled ladies would actually take part in a production like that. To which Charles says, yes, well, when you're in Rome, you've got to do something to fill in the time to make it bearable. Once again, it's the wrong thing to say to Lydia because she can only dream of going to somewhere as cultivated as Rome. And she says, I cannot fancy wanting anything to enliven one in any part of Italy. Whereas Charles explains how it sounds very good from a distance, but it's not so much fun when you're there and you're eating foods and you don't actually know what's in the foods and there's insects and nothing's comfortable and it's very hard to make your needs understood when nobody speaks your language. And what he says is, at Naples, eaten up by mosquitoes and sometimes when it does turn cold, starved alive in those great monstrous palaces all over marble, without a good English grate to warm oneself at. Anyway, he wasn't happy and he finishes by saying, and Mount Vesuvius might be all right to look at. You might like to see it erupting. I would hate it. 
At which Lydia laughs. She thinks that's quite funny. Louisa does her usual mediating and says there might be drawbacks, but there's also advantages of seeing foreign countries. Just think of the way you can expand your ideas. Charles knocks this conversation flat too. He's not fond of new ideas at all. And there's a really good speech that he gives. It's not good as in the words that he says, but it's a very feeling speech. He says, I do not see that one gets any good by new ideas. They do not make one feel more happy and comfortable in reality than one's old ones. I don't feel a bit happier for having been to Rome and Florence and Naples, except from the conviction that I am no longer there. New ideas give rise to new plans and new systems, and I'm convinced they often do more harm than good. Lydia thought it would be a complete waste of words to try to change his mind when he thought such wrong things, but he goes on talking about those foreign doctors. Some curing or more often killing with cold water and their wringing wet sheets, others with boiling baths or all mud, some with gallons of half-ripe grapes or tumblers by the dozen of nasty mineral stuff. Since we know that his father went over to Switzerland because he was so sick, we can kind of see where he's coming from. We can. Obviously, his father went over and tried all these cures to see if he could get better, and it didn't work. Charles actually says, way, way down the bottom of the page, because he talks for some time, I shall always think that if my poor father, instead of running about from place to place and trying so many various modes of cure from those foreign physicians, had kept to old ideas and systems and remained here quietly under the care of Dr. Leonard, he might very probably have been alive at this moment and I should be happier than ever I could be from having gained new ideas on foreign countries. So good and kind a friend I fear I shall never have again, for a better father never lived. He's very unhappy and they can all see that his misery is quite genuine. He is missing his father. He's still sad about the death of his father. And at this point, Lydia, who was a creature of impulse, stretched out her fair hand towards him, but said nothing. Whilst he, quite overcome with so unlooked for a kindness, seized her soft hand, and this time held it so firmly that without a struggle she could not have released it, and raised it to his lips. At which Lydia blushed crimson, and Fred, who was feeling a bit sympathetic towards Charles, is suddenly mad at him. This is something that Charles should not have done. He should not have kissed Lydia's hand without her agreeing to it. It undoes all the sympathy that is starting to feel towards him. Later that evening, Lydia talks with her mother about it, and her mother just smiles and says nothing, at which Lydia says, why don't you give me your opinion? And then it comes out that Sir William had asked Lady Middlemore to say nothing that might influence Lydia. Lady Middlemore very carefully says, you know what I think about marriage. You know what I think a good husband should have. I don't need to tell you now. You have good sense, Lydia, and you can work it out. And she goes on to say that she's very pleased to see that Lydia isn't just swept away by the flattery. Charles Mornington's attention isn't making Lydia vain at all. She's still considering the whole thing carefully. And Lydia is quite pleased that her mother has said this. Lydia admits that Charles Mornington does have a kind heart, but he has absolutely no delicacy about him. The next day, Fred, Louisa and Lydia are sitting outside and Fred says, he's not all that bright and you don't like him, so why are you letting him come over here talking to you like that and acting like that? And Lydia explains for the first time that Sir William has asked her to do this to try to find good in him and see if she might like him. And Lydia says, you're right, I don't care for him at all. I don't care for him any more than I care for my cousins, any more than I care for you. This, of course, is not Fred's liking. And Louisa, typically Louisa, says, he's got some amiable qualities. We have a change of location because my phone battery is running low, because I've been at work all day and there wasn't any opportunity to charge it. And I do want to get this video finished tonight. Fred says, he's not all that bright, is he? And Lydia says, well done for spotting that in a rather sarcastic way. Louisa says, it's not that he isn't bright. It's just that he's not very educated. Fred disagrees. Fred says, he's scarcely fit to live. Certainly not fit for civilised society. Lydia thinks this is going too far. Whether she agrees or not, 
she thinks that Fred is being unnecessarily cruel. So she says, well, Mr. Mornington is an amiable man. He might have turned out much better than he has in different circumstances. He's showing himself to be responsible and serious, and that's a good thing. This makes Fred very mad. He fires up, as he is wont to do, says, well, go ahead then, just marry him, but don't expect me to come to your wedding. And he storms out, slams the door behind him, and kind of frightens both Lydia and Louisa a bit with his fury. After he's gone, Lydia says, well, Mr. Mornington doesn't have much going for him, but at least I'm not afraid of him. And that event was the end of Fred's chance with Lydia. From this time on, we're kind of living every moment of Lydia's day because things start to happen from here. This is the true beginning of the climax of the book. Shortly after this, it's lunchtime. There are visitors for lunch and Lydia, as we have seen right through, is almost late for lunch because she tends to get distracted. When she enters the dining room, most people are seated already. One of them is her friend, Mrs. Leonard. She entered the drawing room just as the dinner was announced and without having time to address any one of the assembled party, found herself seized upon by Mr. Mornington, who had placed himself close to the door, that he might, like a spider in its web, fasten upon his victim the moment it appeared. And that's how she felt. She walked in the door, there was Charles, he kind of cornered her, there weren't many seats left, so she ended up having to sit next to him. When she sat down, she realised Mrs. Leonard wasn't far away on the table, she could hear, hear her talk, even if she couldn't talk to her very easily. And straight across from her was Louisa. There was a strange man sitting next to Louisa who she didn't know. Dr. Leonard couldn't attend, so this man has brought Mrs. Leonard. He turns out to be a house guest of hers at the time. He is a barrister and she learns that his name is Mr. Falconer. He is described as a striking looking man of about two or three and thirty. As the dinner goes on, it says Charles Mornington was more than commonly talkative and he's starting to be not only talkative but a bit presumptive in the things that he's saying. He is a bit too complimentary for one who is really still just a stranger. He's over flattering Lydia. He's complimenting her openly. He's talking about how lovely she is in a way that's just not really appropriate. You might get away with it if you were already engaged and that seems to be how it's coming across as if he's thinking that they have an understanding and that he has the right to do this. She's finding it all very annoying and embarrassing. I do wonder, it doesn't say, as I said in a previous video, they didn't say, but I do wonder if he's drinking again. I think a lot of his behaviour could be explained if you imagine him sitting there drinking. I'd say he probably was. He's had a few drinks and he's, it's making him loquacious and slightly inappropriate. Lydia is embarrassed and she's blushing and she's feeling really bad about that because in this day and age you don't really show your feelings. I mean even in our day and age you don't really want to show your feelings to strangers. So she's feeling a bit exposed and then she notices that the strange man who is almost across from her keeps looking at her. Once soon after she had sat down to dinner she looked opposite and saw Mr Falconer speaking to Louisa though his voice was too much in a whisper to be heard but Louisa immediately looked at her sister and then answered Mr Falconer which plainly declared that he had been inquiring who she was whilst he fixed his eyes upon her in a way that was as embarrassing as Mornington's two expressive sentences. As the meal goes on, Mr Falconer's eyes were constantly turned upon Lydia, even though he was kind of casually and carelessly talking to Louisa every so often, he kept looking at Lydia. Mr Falconer's eyes were so fine and so scrutinising that poor Lydia's fell beneath his almost perpetual gaze and she was vexed to feel how ill she stood it as she did not wish him to perceive that she observed it. Then too, Mornington seemed determined to take up her attention exclusively and his manner was so empresse and so marked with devotion to her that she was sure everybody must notice it. 
so she had a very difficult meal. As it goes on, it's a large group of people and they've broken into like, there's several different conversations going on together up and down the table. And she couldn't hear the voice of the stranger who sat next to her sister. They're still at the table, they're eating dessert, the servants have withdrawn. And finally, she realizes that Mrs. Leonard is talking about mesmerism. This was an early form of hypnotism. It was something that Dr. Leonard was considering in his medical practice. Mrs. Leonard knows a lot about it, and it's something that Lydia is also very interested in. Lydia is very keen to listen to this conversation. Sir William is a little bit skeptical, but being a thorough gentleman, he is too courteous to actually argue with Mrs. Leonard, whereas Charles Mornington quite vocally derides the whole notion. He has very decided opinions about mesmerism as a form of quackery and nothing that a serious person would consider. We can see from Charles Mornington's previous experiences and what he said on the previous day about his father and how his father had tried all these different cures and that Charles feels they actually killed his father rather than prolonged his life. You can see that he wouldn't be a fan of mesmerism, but he's not exercising any diplomacy whatsoever when he picks this time to argue the matter. And Sir William is quite appalled. Mrs. Leonard, however, did not appear in the smallest degree annoyed by Mornington's insipid jokes. Not so Sir William, who was, with all his foibles, a thorough gentleman, and who consequently regarded Mornington's manner on this occasion as highly deficient in good breeding, especially when a lady, and such a lady, was in question. Lydia also is not at all impressed with Charles Mornington for doing this. Mrs. Leonard, however, taking advantage of a momentary lull, called on her friend Mr. Falconer to come to her assistance, because Mr. Falconer knows a great deal about the subject. And so Mr. Falconer starts talking about it. We don't get his words. What we get is that he was a barrister and a very clever barrister. He knew how to form an argument. He knew how to express himself. He's very eloquent. With a deep, full, mellow-toned voice, he did exactly as Mrs. Leonard requested. With such powers of language, in so clearly and explanatory a manner, that all he described seemed actually to be passing before the eyes of the listeners. He argues the point so well that even Mr. Mornington starts to doubt his own opinion. Lydia was, as it were, bewitched. Lydia was particularly struck with his language, possibly because it afforded so vivid a contrast to what she was accustomed to from her father. Mr. Falconer's language flowed on without the slightest effort, whilst he had not one moment's hesitation, yet every word he happened to use seemed to be exactly the right one. His pronunciation too, a thing which we perhaps are not sufficiently careful about, was without any affectation so clear, so graceful, so soft, yet from the power and depth of his voice so totally devoid of all that might savour of ultra-delicacy. There was a charm in it that partook almost of the harmony of music. Lydia had sat with her elbow on the table, one cheek resting on her hand, with downcast eyes, as if contemplating the pretty porcelain plate before her, for she could not venture to look at him, taking in with delight his charming tones, and all that was at the same time so well worth her best attention. At last he paused. She withdrew her arm, looked up, and there were those large dark eyes again fixed upon her. She could hardly stand it, but fortunately at that moment Lady Middlemore rose, and the next Lydia found herself in the drawing room. Because that's what happened. The ladies have retired, leaving the gentlemen at the table. So now we've got the ladies in the drawing room. That's Lady Middlemore and the Middlemore girls and Mrs. Leonard. And Lydia is in a bit of a dream. She felt as if a sort of spell was broken, and for the first time probably in her life she did not rush up eagerly to Mrs. Leonard, but sat down close to one of the open windows, looked out upon the soft fine evening, and thought over all she had been listening to, of him to whom she had been listening. So she's just tumbled into a complete crush on this man. Mrs. Leonard looks at her and sees this, but Mrs. Leonard assumes that the person that Lydia is thinking of is Charles Mornington because he'd been sitting next to her for that whole meal. But as Lydia herself had never alluded to the subject, 
Mrs. Leonard had too much delicacy to ask her any questions, although she was inclined to wonder at it. And then the gentleman joined them, so she didn't get a chance to say anything at that time either. Lydia was hoping that Mr. Falconer would come and sit near her, but he didn't. He did, however, take a vacant chair not very far away. And she's there thinking, he saw Charles Mornington, he heard Charles Mornington speak to me, he thinks that I am engaged to Charles Mornington, so he's not going to come near me. That's what she's thinking, which makes her even more annoyed with Charles Mornington. But then she realises that although Mr Falconer hasn't sat near her, he sat at a round table kind of close to her. He's still looking at her a lot and he can hear what she says. He's picked up a book and he's reading the book. He appeared to be reading, but though his hand shaded his eyes, she felt certain, such is the quickness of woman's glance when interested in observing, that instead of reading, he was again contemplating her through his slightly parted fingers, for not a single page did he turn. Then Mrs. Leonard was called upon to sing. She's got a good voice and a thorough understanding of music. She always made her own to the simple style of song she usually chose. So she writes her own music and she's taken a poem of the day, which is called Oh Weep Not for the Dead, which I found. It came out of Blackwood's magazine in the 1830s. So she's taken this poem and she's put her own music to it and she's done it very simply and it's a style of music that suits her voice. She sang with such deep feeling and clearness of enunciation that nearly every word was audible so that when she ceased there was scarcely an eye in the room unmoistened. Her song was encored and the same charm prevailed but when she came to the words mourn rather for the doom of those who struggle on midst weariness and gloom until their task be done, which she uttered softly and touchingly, a loud and sonorous snore resounded through the room. So loud and so sonorous that Mrs. Leonard, taken by surprise, stopped singing quite involuntarily. All turned their eyes towards that part of the room from whence this snore was repeated, when, behold, in the most remote corner, ensconced in a luxurious armchair, slept Charles Francis Mornington Esquire of Highwood Park, the lover upon trial. A shout of laughter bursts from everybody. It's a funny moment. Charles wakes and suddenly realises everybody's looking at him. The only two who have not laughed are Mr Falconer and Lydia. Mr Falconer had turned his eyes with a scrutinising look upon her. What did that look express? A feeling probably of surprise and pity that such a man as Mornington could be permitted to pay her attention. A man who could sleep and snore in society, and still worse, who could sleep and snore when such music was going on. Poor Charles, woken up suddenly, roused from a most sound and comfortable sleep by that irrepressible burst of laughter, stood up and grinned horribly a ghastly smile for such it certainly was between sleeping and waking, with some degree of shame. For he felt what an indecorum he had been guilty of, and before Lydia too. So he blundered out a thousand apologies, accompanied by another thousand wonders how he could have been so remiss. And he sought refuge by taking a chair close to Lydia. But she, annoyed by his want of all proper decorum and vexed to think that Mr Falconer might fancy her capable of liking the man, rose at the same moment he seated himself and placed herself on an unoccupied sofa not far from the pianoforte. Then it was that Mr Falconer, with a brightened countenance, immediately joined her, and for nearly an hour Lydia was in the full enjoyment of his most delightful conversations. I won't go on, but I just thought I couldn't explain that better than they could. Just all of Lydia's little trials in this evening. Now Mr Falconer realises that she's not interested in Charles. He's starting to come over and talk, and that's what she wants. She realises who he is. He is a well-known and highly gifted barrister whose name she had occasionally seen mentioned in the public papers. Probably she's seen that in the public papers because Mrs. Leonard has pointed it out, because Mrs. Leonard is a friend of his, or Mrs. Leonard and her husband are friends of his. He's a more illustrious person than she has ever come across, and he has all those characteristics that she wanted in a husband. That's the point to take from this. Just about everything that she listed to her father at the start of the book, Mr. Falconer is showing signs of having. 
Before they break up for the night, Mrs. Len sings another song, this one in German. And Lydia goes and gets a German dictionary because she started trying to teach herself a bit of German and she'd like to know what the words meant. Mr. Falconer realises what she's doing. It turns out that he speaks German very well, so he says, I can translate the song for you. And he does so. With his subdued but full-toned voice, he construed it into prose so beautiful the versification could hardly have given it greater attraction. It told of the fascination of eyes of heaven's own blue, of sunny clustering locks, of the winning smile that was in unison with the speaking eye, of the graceful supple form, the melting voice, all combined in that fair but sensitive and shrinking being who would hardly permit her timid lover to look even upon her charms. So like the shy gazelle did she turn from his oft-repeated gaze. And when the translator had ended, his own oft-repeated gaze was renewed. Strange coincidence would have thought any other listener but Lydia. The words of this song seemed to describe her so perfectly. But Lydia didn't think this. She's a fairly innocent child still. The only thing she noticed was at the end, he was looking at her very pointedly and she found that a little bit too much. So she stood and joined the rest. She was now standing between Mrs. Leonard and Louisa, so Mr. Falconer went and stood opposite her on the other side of the piano fort. And while she was standing there, Louisa asked Mrs. Leonard what the words meant, the very thing that Mr. Falconer had just explained to her. Mrs. Leonard said, they don't really have any meaning, it's just a jumble of ancient Germanic words that sound good together. Strange and almost incomprehensible, I doubt if the poet himself quite understood them. The song was about the soul holding a conversation with the body, and everything Mr. Falconer said to her was completely incorrect. So Lydia now realises that he was telling her how he saw her, that what he'd actually been doing was flirting with her and paying her compliments. Lydia looked at him and expected him to seem embarrassed by this, but he's not at all. He stood calm and unconcerned, turning over the music that lay on the pianoforte. He even gently raised his eyes to encounter Lydia's surprised and involuntary glance. And she doesn't know what to think about this at all. Most of the people go away, but for some reason, Mrs. Leonard and Mr. Falconer's carriage is late, so they're there for a short while later. So William's quite happy about this, even though it makes them late, because he does like Mrs. Leonard's company. And Mrs. Leonard asks Sir William if Lydia can come and visit her the next week. On Thursday, actually, which is only a couple of days away. Sir William doesn't really like this, but he can't find a way to say no, and he has enjoyed Mrs. Leonard's company and he doesn't want to ruin the mood. So he very reluctantly agrees. It turns out that Mr. Falconer is going to be staying with Dr. Leonard and Mrs. Leonard for the next few days. So Lydia's really excited about this. She's going to be staying in the same house as not only Mrs. Leonard, but also this very fascinating man, Mr. Falconer. That evening in her room, she tells Louisa what she thinks of Mr. Falconer and also how he translated the song. Louisa had noticed him looking at Lydia very often and wasn't too concerned about that. She thought it was fairly natural, but Louisa has nothing good to say about his mistranslation of the poem. It was an untruth, said the right-minded girl. And what did the untruth mean? Surely not a real declaration. Mr. Falconer cannot be the sort of man to make and declare positive love to a girl whom he has only known during three short hours. But even if mere admiration, it was expressed and shown in too presumptuous a manner. It's unaccountable too, from the little I saw of him at dinner. I should have said he must be a man of a reserved nature. Besides, he's staring at you in that manner. Such admiration is too bold. Do not heed it, Lydia. Lydia laughed and said no more, but she thought about it a great deal. I only have a few thoughts about this section of text. One is that by modern standards, it's rather late in a story to introduce a new character, but it kind of fits the story that just when she's starting to get a feel for her options and what she thinks about those options and where she fits in the world. Everything's gone out the window and she has to start all over again. Life does happen that way. Another thing I noticed was that there was a few more problems with names. Highlands became Highwood Park. 
very briefly. I'd say the author just hadn't really settled on one. And since this book was published posthumously, chances are she would have actually gone through and corrected a lot of these errors if she hadn't passed away when she did. There was a bit in the conversation between Lydia and her mother early on. I sort of skimmed over it here, but they were talking about husbands and the role of a husband. Lydia said, I have heard you say that there are parents who bring up their daughters with no other view but to become as attractive as possible in looks and manners, merely with the hope of their settling down in life with any man who may chance to take them, and who is well off as to station and fortune. But that has not been our case, and thus I hope, if ever we do marry, our husbands will be able to go on improving what you have so kindly and carefully begun. That is very much an 1850s perspective, the notion of the husband as an educator of his wife, somebody who helped form the wife's morals and standards and principles. Lady Middlemore, in her response, says, married or unmarried, you will still have your enjoyments. But she also says, it is my firm opinion that married life is, generally speaking, the best lot for woman. I couldn't help looking at everyone a bit differently in this section now that we know about Clarissa. Lady Middlemore, for instance, she lost a daughter four years ago. That must have been a terrible thing. I can see why everybody is so careful of Lydia now, why Lydia is kind of spoiled and cosseted and indulged. They're probably just so glad that she's recovered at all. To lose a twin sister would be an extremely difficult thing and a difficult thing for all of them to have lost a sister. Even the freedom that Fanny gets makes more sense when you know about Clarissa. So Clarissa's death actually affected the whole family and some of what we see in the way the family operates now is the way that they are dealing with that death four years after it occurred. But this was a time period when so many people did die, everyone lost loved ones. Charles Mornington, for instance, who's still mourning his father. It wasn't all that uncommon. And I expect that is also why the friendship with Mrs. Leonard has been encouraged. Mrs. Leonard is the doctor's wife. The doctor attended Clarissa through her illness. No doubt Mrs. Leonard was involved in that too and did all she could to help. And her friendship with Lydia was probably part of Lydia's recovery, which I would imagine is why Sir William and Lady Middlemore allowed the friendship. When it does seem slightly out of character and some of the things that Mrs. Leonard does takes Lydia into a more adult sphere than she's really ready for. It all makes sense when you know. Perhaps had she had a chance to edit this book before it was published, there would have been more early on in the story to explain that. I mean, the book, it does hold together quite well. There's just those little things that might have made it a far stronger story than it is. But it is still a great story. There's a lot of quite good writing in here. There's a lot of nice pacing. And since I'm working every day of the week at the moment, including weekends, doing lots of overtime, I'm not going to say any more for this one. I'm just going to finish the video and upload it. And the final of this series on The Lover Upon Trial will now be video six, which I will upload in another week. Thank you for watching.